Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. We wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you also get a free two-month trial to Otter, worth $26, alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. Thanks again for supporting Always Take Notes. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with the journalist and author, Oliver Bullo. We spoke to Oliver about writing about oligarchs in the year Putin invaded Ukraine, about navigating the complexities of English libel law, and about the response to his new book, Butler to the World. It's a great episode, and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Oliver, to Always Take Notes. Could we start with your latest book, um, Butler to the World? Where did the idea for that come from, and how long did you spend reporting it? Thanks very much for having me on. Um, so I've been writing about financial crime for most of a decade, actually since 2014, when there was a revolution in Ukraine, which was largely driven by anger over corruption. And I became very interested in corruption in Ukraine, which rapidly led me to understand that corruption in Ukraine is actually part of corruption everywhere, since it's all part of the globalised financial system. So I wrote a book about that called Moneyland. Um, and then I suppose I just kept tripping over the fact that whatever the scam, wherever the scam, the UK was always involved. The money might be laundered here, or the lawyers might be here, or the reputation defending libel courts might be here, or the super yacht captain might be from here, or the children might be educated here, or the art gallery might take a donation here, or whatever. It didn't really matter that wherever the kleptocracy, there was almost invariably a UK angle. And it struck me that that was an interesting phenomenon, an important phenomenon, and a pretty, if you're British, a pretty dark phenomenon, um, and something worth exploring. So Butler to the World is essentially my attempt to explain how Britain became the enabler-in-chief uh, for financial crime um, and financial wrongdoing and general skullduggery by everyone, everywhere. And with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, your book, along along with some others, along with uh, Tom Burgess's and Catherine Belton's books, have had this kind of extraordinary moment with people almost, you, you know, pointing to them and, and almost to something that was that was hiding in plain sight or that people chose not to look at. What's that that experience been like for you as kind of international events have pushed this to the top of the the agenda? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's been horrible. I've obviously, I have many friends in Ukraine. I used to when I lived in Moscow. I used to go to Ukraine just on the train, you know, it's a Friday afternoon and think, oh, I'll go to Ukraine for the for the weekend and get on the train, overnight train to Kiev and wake up and spend the weekend in Kiev and come back for Monday morning. It was like going to Bristol or like going to Edinburgh if you live in London. So what's happening to Ukraine is horrible. But there has been, I think, as a result of um, what Putin has unleashed on the Ukrainians, an awareness of the UK's role, uh, the broader Western role in tolerating the Putin kleptocracy and in supporting it, in providing a home for the oligarchs and their wealth in a way that we obviously shouldn't have done. And so there is this rather fevered discussion now among politicians and policymakers about, you know, what what we should have done, what we should now do. So yes, it does feel a little bit like all the people who have been refusing to take my calls for eight years are suddenly phoning me up, which is great, obviously. It's just awful that it should have taken a tragedy like what's happening in Ukraine to get us to this point. Uh, considering, you know, the, the the tragedies that we've just blitzed right the way through without getting to this point, you know, the, the murder of Alexander Litvinenko in 2006, invasion of Georgia in 2008, uh, the annexation of Crimea in 2014, the attempted murder of Sergei and Yulia Skripal and the murder of Dawn Sturgis in 2018. It hasn't come out of a cloudless sky, this particularly grim thundercloud from, from the Kremlin. So yes, it's great that finally people are catching up with the fact that oligarchs are not necessarily wealth creators, entrepreneurs and philanthropists that we want to welcome into our countries. But it, yeah, it is occasionally a little bit hard 
not to sort of wave my arms in the air and, and, and sort of vent a bit about the fact that it took us so long to get here. Your book obviously addresses Russian oligarchs, but what's the division between subjects from that country and, and from other kind of parts of the world? Yeah, so I don't really see any particular distinction between Russian oligarchs and other oligarchs. One of the slightly annoying things about the response of not just the UK government, but governments in general to what's happened in Ukraine is this urgent crackdown on Russian oligarchs while simultaneously doing literally nothing about other oligarchs. It feels very reactive um, that, that it isn't the oligarch we object to. We object to the foreign policy of the country where the oligarch comes from, which seems absurd, really, uh, because you know it's not inconceivable to think that in two years time, say, there might be a crisis around Taiwan and suddenly we'll be scrambling to dig up the money of Chinese oligarchs and be wondering, how did that happen? When it's quite obvious how it happened. It happened in the same way as the Russian oligarchs got here. So, you know, I think that this focus on Russian oligarchs, I can understand it. Um, It's a sort of foreign policy decision. But there has not yet been anything like the recognition that this should be a law enforcement response and it should be proactive, not reactive. And we should be investigating the provenance of money that's coming into our economies proactively and therefore giving money to and resources and people to our law enforcement agencies, not just slapping sanctions on people after the government of the country where they come from has done something bad. And you trace the kind of origin of this Butler pose back to Suez in 1956 and this idea of a British retreat from empire and and seeking a new role. Could you unpack that a bit? Yeah, it's a really fascinating story, um, quite a complicated story, and one that I sort of stripped down and simplified for the book, and I'll strip down and simplify it further because I can go full nerd here. But the basic of it is that when Britain ran the British Empire, the British financial system, and the City of London in particular, kind of was the world's financial system. Um, You know, if you wanted to insure a cargo, you did it in London. If you wanted to move money, you did it in London. If you wanted to raise money, you did it in London. And then when the empire drifted apart, when countries gained their independence from us and, and, and went off on their own way, the City of London went from being you know, the world's financial centre to just being Britain's financial centre. But all of this plumbing, this financial plumbing that persisted, that had previously moved money around the British Empire and the various associated countries to the British Empire, was still there. So it was lying dormant. It was ready to be reactivated. And the moment, it actually slightly before Suez, but Suez is the moment when it really goes mega. The, the, the important moment happened a year before Suez, when two bankers from two banks, the Midland uh, British Bank and the Moskovsky Narodny Bank, a Soviet-owned bank, realised that if they banked dollars in London and used dollars in London rather than pounds, which obviously was previously the, the currency of the city of London and had previously been the, you know, the world's major international currency, if they used dollars instead, then they'd sort of created this magical rules-free space because by using dollars, British regulations didn't apply because they only applied to pounds. And by operating in London, American regulations didn't apply because they only applied in the United States. So they created a hole in the then really quite strict international rules about international money flows. And when there's a hole in rules, when you don't have to obey the rules that other people with money have to obey, the profits are clearly enormous. Potential profits are enormous. Them having discovered this hole, other banks rapidly followed to to, to move money through the same hole. And it ended up as essentially a, a giant loophole in the global financial architecture. And that financial architecture had been designed, specifically and deliberately designed, to prevent money moving freely around the world, because that was seen as destabilizing and anti-democratic. The idea was that you prioritized governmental control over money flows to give essentially the people control over the wealthy. Um, But by providing this loophole in the global system, London freed the wealthy to act in their own interests rather than in the interests of everyone. Um, It took a little while for it to really kick off. This market was worth about $4 billion by 1960, about 40 billion, 10 times bigger by the end of the 1960s. Now it's the biggest market in the world. It's worth about $3 trillion a year. It's absolutely colossal. And, and they needed a, a, a word, a term for this loophole that they'd created, this market they'd created. And, and they needed, you know, what is a legal concept for a space that has no rules? Well, they had that. That's You have that in maritime law. If you get in a boat and sail out onto the high seas, there are no rules because you're not in a country anymore. Um, and so they called it offshore because it was 
you know, figuratively outside the reach of any government's control. And that concept offshore is what the City of London gave us. And I think it's quite possibly the most significant concept of the second half of the 20th century in terms of empowering the wealthy and disempowering democracies. Uh, the, the legal loopholes created by this concept offshore, these, it's an entirely artificial concept, um, have, have, have allowed the owners of wealth to break free from democratic control with far-reaching consequences for almost everything that we're only now beginning to understand. In the book, you liken Britain's role to Jeeves of Jeeves and Worcester. Um, and I enjoyed the anecdote you tell about visiting the kind of Butler's Academy. Um, would you mind recounting it for, for listeners? The, the origin of the, the term butler to the world, I, she came to me, I, 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 after I came up with it, I, I did actually Google it and realised that other people had come up with it first. So I'm not claiming to be the first coiner of the term that Britain is the butler to the world. But I did come up with it independently. I wasn't stealing it from anyone, just, just putting that out there. I, I was in conversation with an American academic who wanted to understand how Britain was investigating and prosecuting Chinese money laundering, which obviously is a, is a, is a very big deal. Huge amounts of money, Chinese-owned money moves through the financial system in a sort of secretive way every year. Um, and he kept asking me all these questions about who was doing what. And I had to sort of rein him in and point out that Britain doesn't do any of the things he was asking me about. You know, America does those things. And I was trying to explain the difference between America and Britain. So I said, well, America is the policeman to the world. Britain is, what is it? Well, it, well I suppose it's the butler to the world. You, you, you try and stop crime, we, we just help. And, and not really sure what to do with this metaphor, but, but rather thinking it was quite a good metaphor. Um, I then decided to sort of go and hang out in a butler training school to see, you know, I suppose I, my idea was I would follow a group of butlers as they became trainee butlers, as they became real butlers, and then maybe see where they went and what they did. But obviously, it was a it was a dreadful idea because quite obviously no butler worth his salt would agree to tell me the secrets of their clients. And quite obviously, no butler training school was going to let me hang around for very long, not certainly after they've Googled me and realised I write about financial crime. So that didn't stick. And I needed, therefore, sort of other butlery ideas, because I never met an actual butler, you know, other butlery ideas to, to understand how butlers tick. And so obviously, I turned to the world's most famous personal servant, G Reginald Jeeves. Um, and this being lockdown, I read all five volumes of the collected stories of, you know, Jeeves and Worcester. And the interesting thing about Jeeves is there's this sort of, I suppose, idea from people who've just read a couple of the stories or just seen the TV programs or just heard of him, that he's this rather cuddly, um, avuncular, friendly figure who, who just helps people out of scrapes in a, in, a, in a charming way while bringing them cups of tea. He's not like that at all. He's a rogue, like a real rogue. Um, he, he's, he's like a one man crime wave. Some of the stuff he, he gets up to is appalling, um, you know, he, he, particularly with regard to the forces of law and order. He, you know, he perverts judicial procedures uh, he bribes a police officer. He coshes a police officer at one point. Um, he, he he drugs a fellow, you know, valet in order to steal some inf inside information, and then uses inside information to terrify a fascist into silence. I mean, he's a he's a fearless criminal operator, and and so it, it seemed absolutely perfect to use him as an example of an amoral enabler of financial crime who's prepared to do anything to earn fees from his clients, because that's literally what he is. So that was fun. And, and it has this sort of secondary lesson, which you can learn from the Jeeves story as well, which is that why is it that we don't think of him like this, right? Because if you were to tell the Jeeves and Worcester stories in, in a different way, you know, Bertie Wooster is a sort of Bullingdon Club thug, right? Who goes around, you know, picking fights with police officers on boat race night. Um, and Jeeves gets him off, you know, all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of astonishingly gross satire of British class politics. But, you know, why is it that we don't see it that way? Because the story is always told from Bertie Wooster's perspective. It's a bit like, you know, if, if we only read about what the government gets up to from Boris Johnson's perspective, we'd probably think he was a genial chap doing the best he can and generally having a pretty hilarious time, you know, with misadventures with wallpaper and so on. You know, it's only when you see it from the outside that you realise how appalling it is. And that's the issue with, you know, I think what Britain's been getting up to is, is its sort of butlering industry that, that we almost always see it from our perspective. But if you see from the perspective of the Ukrainians who've had their health service destroyed by corrupt insiders or, or the Russians who've, who've, you know, seen their country turn into a kleptocracy and have any kind of hope of democracy snuffed out or, or, or Nigerians who've had their country looted and, and, and the money transported to here instead, you know, it isn't funny at all. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to do was to try and you know, shift the frame of the of the story. So we don't look at it from the perspective of 
lawyers who are doing very well from their clients' fees, but instead look at it from the, the victims of those clients and, and to, to look at the lawyers and wonder whether actually they should have been taking that money in the first place. We wanted to come back to uh, Butler of the World in, in due course, but could we fold back now to, to your early life and your beginnings as, as a writer? Is it correct that you grew up on a sheep farm before going off to study history at university? Yeah, I did. Um, my, my dad was a sheep farmer in Powys, Radnorshire, until I was 10. He sold the farm when I was nine or 10, uh, just before my birthday, actually, and um, ended up uh, running a small sawmill, um, so uh, just near Hay on Wye, actually. Uh, so I, I grew up outside Hay um, and then went away to university to study history in, in 1996. And I'd always had this slightly to the complete bafflement of my family. I'd always had this slight obsession with Eastern Europe um, in general uh, and Russia and the former Soviet Union in particular. Uh, there's some debate about where it came from. I don't think the debate's ever been settled. Um, we don't have any kind of family connection to that part of the world or anything like that. Nothing, you know, there's no obvious explanation. So I just moved to Russia when I finished university. It struck me as I didn't really want a proper job. I didn't want to be a you know, management consultant or whatever. The, the, you know, the jobs that were advertised in the in the various sort of careers fairs. Um, so I just moved to Russia and decided to learn Russian and see what happened. I started working as a journalist just because it's one of the only jobs you can do if you don't know anything and just carried on really. I'd had this, it's a very naive idea uh, that going to Russia would be an opportunity to see a kind of historically one-off experience of seeing Russia become democratic. You know, it had always been an autocracy or a dictatorship, um, pretty much, with, with very few examples of it being anything else. And those examples very short-lived. Uh, so I suppose I thought that I would be able to witness its transformation. Wouldn't that be an amazing story to tell my grandchildren? But actually just two or three weeks before I arrived in St. Petersburg in 1999, Vladimir Putin became prime minister. Um, and he's remained either prime minister or president ever since with, with you know, consequences that we all know. So actually, as a journalist, um, I mainly work for Reuters in Moscow. As a journalist, I didn't write about, obviously, democratisation and the sort of spread of freedom and Russia turning into Denmark. Instead, it was the opposite, the Russia turning back into, well, Russia, and, you know, the extin extinguishing of the, the few political and business and, and media freedoms that had been secured in the 1990s. So that was obviously a really depressing experience, to be honest. Not universally. Russia was wonderful. I loved living in Russia. But, but just the, the stories I was writing about were, were tended to be fairly depressing. You know, there was a lot of criticism, obviously, from Western countries of what Putin was up to. And, um, but I, I kept having this kind of harking away in the back of my head, this, this sort of disconnect about the fact that you know, most of the time we wrote about the extinguishing of democratic freedoms and how the oligarchs around Putin were taking over everything. And then very occasionally, every couple of weeks or a couple of months or whatever, we would be asked to write about some oligarch who just bought up a giant mansion in London or a football club or, or, or you know, brought illegal proceedings or floated his company on the London Stock Exchange or whatever. And it seemed very weird how an oligarch who was appalling in Russia, all they had to do was fly to Heathrow get off the plane and, and splash some money around and suddenly they're an entrepreneur. And that disconnect seemed extremely hypocritical to me. And, and it's just seemed to get starker and starker, that division uh, between, you know, the Western government's description of the oligarchs and then Western government's reception of the oligarchs. Uh, and so that's essentially, certainly with Moneyland, that's what I decided to try and write about was this, the way that corruption works and the way that corrupt money moves, not within countries, but between countries um, and how an individual is able to essentially slip out of the bounds of, of the legal system. Uh, and just because they're so rich, they, they gain access to a whole new way of being treated. Um, and it's been you know, incredibly harmful to the prospects of democratic development in Ukraine and Russia and Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan and all these other countries that I love, because, you know, the entire elite basically gets to treat the development of the country as a spectator sport. If your assets are outside Russia... Um, and they're invested in Belgravia or wherever, then you don't really care what happens to Russia, not on a deep level. Um, if it falls apart, then it's just not really any skin off your nose. You you, you don't have any any you know dog in that particular fight. So, um, you know, th this offshore system created and maintained by the UK has essentially allowed the oligarchs to colonise their own countries and, and watch them as they're, you know, essentially slip further and further into decrepitude um, just because their money is safe, whatever happens.
Am I right in thinking that your interest in corruption was also developed on a smaller scale? I found a quote from a previous interview where you said, when it came to becoming concerned about financial crime, it's more that financial crime was concerned about me. What was that like, your experience of living in Russia and dealing with bribes and and that sort of thing? You can't live in Russia without paying bribes. I mean, I recognise there is a very strong argument, principled moral argument against paying bribes. Um, And it's very important that you know, governments and businesses and so on don't engage with it. However, it is very difficult to see the value of that particular moral argument if you've been arrested and put in a room and you're being told that if you don't pay $200 to settle whatever ludicrous fine you've been charged with, you're probably not going to come out for 10 years. Um, So I'm afraid, yeah, I did pay a lot of bribes. It's just inevitable. Uh, If someone has complete power over you, and your property and your friends, then you don't really have any option. But when I say you don't have any option, of course, I did have an option. I could just leave, right? Um, You know, anytime I wanted, I could just go and live in Britain or another European country and I'd be fine. Whereas Russians and Ukrainians and Azeris don't have that option. They get predated upon by government officials all the time. And that, what I was talking about, what I ever experienced was always the very you know, retail end of the corruption ecosystem. You know, I'd get hit by a, a, a policeman or by a doctor or by a local government official or a security guard or a border guard or whatever. People, they'd ask me for $50, $100, $200. I can normally haggle them down, you know, that stuff. But in, if you if you look at how corruption works more systematically, you realise that that's just the very bottom level. Those are the kind of krill at the bottom of the ecosystem gradually you know that money flows upwards and by the time someone is at the top of the hierarchy like a government minister or deputy minister or a director of a state enterprise they're earning millions of these bribes you know because people at the lower level pay tribute to people above you end up with an entire parallel state infrastructure so what i i suppose discovered particularly in ukraine because ukraine had had a revolution and and suddenly everything was much more obvious and possible to see what was happening what I discovered is that what I'd always thought of as being an irritation, you know, this having to pay a bribe just to live an ordinary life, was not an irritation at all. It's a system. And it's an entire system that is maintained and designed and and, and deliberately done so by the people who are in charge of it, because they wish to transform a government from being a system to, to uh, you know, a way of serving a nation in, into a, an instrument for private profit. And that's what the governments in, in or the govern the, the, the rulers of you know, Russia and Ukraine and Azerbaijan and so on have done. So that transformation, the realisation that corruption is not an irritation, but a system that, that really led me to delve very deeply into how kleptocracy works. And and then it's very, you realise very, very quickly that you can't understand it just on a national level because, you know, the, the crimes are being hidden by shell companies registered in London or the British Virgin Islands. And the money is being laundered via, you know, a bank in the Baltic States and ending up in Luxembourg or whatever. So you realise very, very quickly, once you've realised that it's not a retail problem, but a sort of a wholesale problem, um, it, it's just a single step to realise that it's not a, a, a Russian problem or a Ukrainian problem, but a transnational problem. Um, and, and that's, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the rabbit hole I went down and I'm still exploring this particular war and I feel like I'm, I've only just begun, really. And in those um, early years in Russia, how did you go about kind of establishing yourself as a journalist, you know, from a, an English language magazine in St. Petersburg to, to the Times of Central Asia, I believe, in Bishkek, and then and then for Reuters. How did how did that progression work? And then a ha- why did you decide in the end to, to leave Reuters? <laughs> so Pulse magazine St. Petersburg was a lot of fun. It was a monthly uh, nightlife listings magazine. But I think the two of us who, who put it together would be the first to admit that its journalistic standards were not high. We were mainly motivated by the nightlife aspect of the job rather than the journalistic aspect of the job. I loved it there. I, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, St. Petersburg had a wonderful music scene uh, and incredible. I mean, the ballet, you know, you could go to the ballet for like 40p. It was the best ballet company in the world. It was absolute heaven. But I, after about a year there, I had this sort of sudden overwhelming feeling of guilt that I wasn't being a very serious person. So I, I decided to find another job and I literally just typed into Google English language publication, former Soviet Union. And I think like the second thing or the third thing that came up was the Times of Central Asia. So I just sent them an email for asking for a job. Uh, this is in uh, 2000, I think. I said, could I have a job? Uh, and they replied in about a minute and a half saying, when can you get here? Which I think at the time I should have seen as a red flag. But um, but at the time I was just like, oh, great, well, they're keen. So I just went to Bishkek and um, 
and that was a you know um there, there were issues there of all kinds um it was it was a troubling a troubling place to try and be a journalist not least the fact that i had no idea how to be a journalist but it was great it was it was a lot of fun i enjoyed living there too um and while i was there um uh, um, I normally got my news from the BBC. Uh, the BBC website was down, so I thought, well, who else does news? And I looked at the Reuters website, and uh, they didn't have any news, but they did have a job job openings, and it said graduate trainee scheme. You know, you can apply, and I had like three days till the deadline. I thought, oh, look, I'll apply for that. Um, that looks good. So I applied for that, and, and they gave me a position. Uh, so I had training in London for a year, and then they were like, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to Moscow. And they said, what happens if we don't send you to Moscow? And I said, well, I'll quit. And they said, oh, you can go to Moscow. So I went to Moscow um, for a bit, like five years. Um, and, you know, in, in Reuters, it's all changed. They don't quite have as much money as they used to do, but they used to treat it like the diplomatic service. You, you move from posting to posting to posting. And they said, but, but my, at the time, my, my girlfriend, my now wife, is, is, um, is a doctor here in the UK. And uh, she basically was quite clear that I had to make a choice between being a foreign correspondent and, and her. Um, you know, she didn't put it exactly like that, but that was, you know, what I was very clearly made to understand. Um, and so I chose her and um, and came back to the UK when I, I tried to work for Reuters in London for a bit, but it wasn't nearly as much fun writing about the oil products market as it had been, you know, bouncing around Russia, reporting on everything that was happening. Um, so I left after six months of, of, of unsuccessfully trying to to persuade myself that I was interested in being in Canary Wharf and, and, and became a freelancer, which is what I've been doing ever since. In that period when you were based in Kyrgyzstan before you had the formal training um, and you were writing about the Chechen conflict, what did you learn about the kind of art of reporting in that period as you were sort of feeling it out for yourself? Uh, it's hard to say, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I've always had this essentially a uh, a basic principle, which I think is probably wrong. We might get to this later, but I always had this principle that if I thought something was interesting, other people probably would as well. So I, I was always just trying to find just interesting things that were happening to write about. And, you know, the the, the, the sort of challenge in Kyrgyzstan in a way is that there wasn't very much that, that was happening uh, politically or, or indeed economically. So that wasn't an easy thing to find stuff to fill a newspaper every week. Uh, so I used to write about uh, horses or dogs or the market or you know, gas pipelines or or whatever you know railways there was a railway so it wasn't but it wasn't a um it wasn't a rich 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 pickings it was actually quite you know a little bit reminiscent of my first ever journalistic job working on the uh, bracken and Randler express um when you know you, you did have to sort of scratch around for a bit for the news you had to you know um uh, you know, it wasn't things. Things weren't just landing on your plate, fully formed as it, a bit. So it felt a lot more like local journalism uh, than you know the kind of national journalism. I suppose that that it, it maybe I thought it would be. I suppose I you know I, I didn't know anything about Central Asia. I'm slightly ashamed to admit. Um, uh, and I suppose I thought that because it had a stand on the end, it would be you know like Afghanistan and be very exciting. Whereas actually, it was just like a a small you know rather you know, beautiful, but impoverished former Soviet country, gorgeous place, but not much happening. So really, journalistically speaking, you know, I sort of fumbled around and pleased myself because I was my own editor. And no one really seemed to care what I wrote or possibly even read it. So it was only going to Reuters and, you know, where they were you know, very sort of clear about how you wrote journalism and, you know, the, the you know, pyramids, inverse pyramids and, you know, the five W's and all that stuff. That um that I learned how to actually write stories um and I loved it I loved being at Reuters you know the 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 sort of never knowing what any day would bring and you know the constant travelling around from one place to another it, it was absolutely wonderful I spent a lot, obviously a lot of time in the Kremlin and that was fun uh you know meeting Russian officials it was great working for an organisation you didn't get this at the times of Central Asia if you worked for Reuters you, you could ring up anyone and say hi it's Reuters and they'd be like oh okay hi Reuters. And that was fun, right? Because you really felt sort of at the centre of things. It's interesting what you say about Reuters. Um, I was a stringer for Reuters in, in West Africa, so I, I have a sort of sense of that. But one thing that I that, that kind of resonated with me from what you said is this difference between the opportunity of like being at the far end of Reuters and doing kind of exciting stuff and, and gallivanting around a foreign country, and then this this like very business focused kind of feeling that you have to write about you know grain futures or or whatever like that. I mean, were you the I suppose the other thing that I thought was 
I was always conscious there was quite a kind of caste difference between people who were on staff and people who were stringers in terms of how they how they were paid and, and particularly things like insurance and stuff like that. Was that a factor in, in Russia and in Central Asia as well? No, I mean, not so much because the, the I mean, I, I know that definitely happened and we did have stringers, uh, but we, we were pretty good. We, look, we looked after them pretty well, I think. Um, I, I sort of Chechnya was my specialist area. So I had a whole a whole kind of string of stringers, as it were, across that whole part of southern Russia. And, and we were, because obviously it was very dangerous, we, we were pretty careful to, to look after them and, and make sure that they got what they needed. I don't know how things are now. Um, you, but yes, you know, like any like any organisation where you have a sort of division between expats and locals, you inevitably have a sort of hierarchy that, that, that develops, particularly when you had these, you know, I was very junior, but when you had these kind of senior managers who went around and, you know, they'd be parachuted in to be the bureau chief and they were on these like, incredible salaries and they never actually seemed to do anything um but i wasn't like that i was so fascinated by the work that i was constantly badgering to do more work i wanted to work all the time um, I, f- I thought it was really really wonderful um you know it was such an amazing opportunity I, I do slightly i slightly regret now um that i didn't make more of the time i spent on the financial market side of reuters because actually that's really interesting um and potentially you know you're 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 really looking at the sort of sinews of how the world economy works and and how money moves and 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 all that it's absolutely fascinating but because i you know i had been a war reporter and i was grumpy that i wasn't a war reporter anymore i really felt that i was um wasting my time and and not not doing the job that i'd been put on god's earth to do um when actually now i think that the work i do writing about money is far more interesting uh, than the work I did, you know, hiding behind a wall and trying to work out who was shooting at me, because you know, I, you don't actually ever end up finding anything out. There's a there's a line I I, I read and I genuinely can't remember where I read it, but it, it made a real impression on me. I'm not enough of an impression to remember who said it, but it's still an impression, which was um, that that um, uh, the people who win battles are never on the battlefield. And and I read that I think you know sitting in Abkhazia at a sort of military checkpoint, not being allowed past, and during the Georgian War of 2008 and and uh, and I thought, oh yeah, well that's that's a good point. I should stop just you know sitting at military checkpoints, never finding anything out, and trying to go somewhere else and actually finding out what's going on. Uh, so that's kind of what I've been trying to sort of move towards. Hello, it's Artemis, the producer of Always Take Notes. I hope you're enjoying Simon and Rachel's conversation with the journalist and author Oliver Billow. It's time for the next instalment of our segment where we share bonus material from previous guests of the show. So this week we're going to hear from the novelist Tracy Chevalier on a piece of advice she wished she'd had at the start of her career. (laughs) Many, many. But one of them, I I would say, um, uh, the big mistake I made with The Virgin Blue was to, every time I got a new bit of information, I'd start all over again I would write a quarter of the novel and go oh no this has happened I've got to go back and redo it and actually it's much more efficient to write straight through set the side set aside that whatever it was you wanted to change and write the draft all the way through because you only really know what you're talking about what you're writing about if you've got the whole the whole imperfect story in front of you um and then you go back and fix it and add things in and take things out. That was Tracy Chevalier. And if you were interested in what Tracy had to say, you can listen to our full interview with her via our website, which is www.alwaystakenotes.com. But for now, back to Simon and Rachel's conversation with Oliver Bullo. we talk now about your book let our fame be great about the caucasus which you published in 2010 when did you report that was that alongside your work at reuters and um how did you go about putting together a proposal and finding an agent <clears throat> so that grew out of the work i'd done in chechnya i love chechnya i had lots of good friends there it, but it was frustrating just writing daily news because it was so complicated and there was so much happening that it was very difficult to get all the background you needed into it because you needed to get shoehorn like 300 years of background into an 800 word article. And obviously that's a bit of a tricky ask. So after I left Reuters, I, I really felt like that was, I had unfinished business writing about that part of the world. I actually, um, I wrote a book proposal um, sort of on spec really, uh, not really knowing what a book proposal should look like and not really knowing what I should do with it. I, I was a friend of, of my wife, my girl, my then girlfriend, 
who, who worked in publishing and I showed it to her and she's um, lovely and she said, look, this is a brilliant idea, but it's far too good for the publishers I work for. Why don't I share it to a friend of mine who works for Penguin? Um, so she did and, and you know, it's a sort of slightly old boy stroke girl network, you know, obviously not how the world should work, but it worked in my favour. Um, and then the, the friend at Penguin said, great, yeah, let's let's do it. So so she signed it up and then I um I wanted to do lots and lots of travelling uh, because part of the phenomenon of the history of southern Russia, uh, of the Caucasus Mountains, has been these repeated uh, exoduses um, of people from that part of the world, whether it's, it's the Circassians in the 19th century who were expelled to the Middle East or the Chechens, who a lot of them have come to Europe or or Stalin exiling the Karachan and the Balkars to Central Asia and so on. It, it's, you know, it is a incredibly ethnically diverse part of the world and this very, very dispersed population. So I wanted to travel to try and find these diaspora communities in, in Jordan and Israel and Turkey and, and, and throughout Eastern Europe and so on. Um, and I needed quite a lot of money to do that, far more money than I, I had. Uh, and I got a grant from the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust um, who, who gave me, I was hoping to they'd give me two grand and they gave me eight, which was just so wonderful. And that, that paid for me to go traveling for six months. Um, and so I got to get the joy of not having, you know, I love my children, but but in the joy of the pre-child life, I could go traveling for six months. It was amazing. So I, I went, I spent loads of time in Turkey, loads of time in the Middle East, loads of time in Central Asia, finding, tracking down these communities and talking to them and and, and then combining what they'd told me with with what I'd read, uh, histories uh, and stuff. And so Let Our Fame Be Great is a is a kind of travel book of sorts and a history book um, and and trying to tell the story of the North Caucasus, which is a very under um, written about part of the world um, through the lens of the effect on the local people of the Russian conquest of the area. And the Russian conquest is, is you know, has gone on sort of essentially since the late 18th century up to the present day, really, it just continues. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's always been, it's this history of just repeated acts of genocide. Uh, it, and um, so it's a sort of a, you know, a, a story of survival Really, the, the the name that the let our fame be great. The title comes from a uh, a folk tale of the Caucasus about um, supposedly God giving um, the Nats, who were the sort of heroic legendary ancestors of the people of the Caucasus, the choice between being living in luxury or 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 having glorious sort of poverty. And their response was, "Though, though our lives be short, let our fame be great." Um, and the, the irony of it is that their fame isn't great. No one really knows anything about them. So I suppose, you know, my aim with the book was to try and spread their fame a little bit more, to try and give them the fame that they deserved. Because, you know, it's a wonderful part of the world and with, with really rich cultures, which are very little understood. And when you moved to writing about financial crime, particularly with Moneyland in 2018 and then, and then with the latest book, how have you navigated the kind of environment of threat and, and challenge and pushback, and particularly in the UK where our... You know, our libel laws uh, do not necessarily favour the the reporter compared to, say, in the United States. Yeah, this took me a bit of learning, to be honest. I entered into writing about oligarchs with sort of the same kind of sense of of fury as I'd been writing about war criminals. Um, and it came as a bit of a shock to start getting these letters from, you know, <clears throat> reputation management companies and libel firms telling me that I needed to... to to change what I'd written or, or whatever. Yeah, it was a bit of a steep learning curve. It, it's just something you need to deal with, like the weather, isn't it, really? Um, you know, I would prefer it if the law were otherwise, but it is what it is. Um, so I, you know, I try and find different tricks and tools to write what I want to write, but without incurring the wrath of those lawyers. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I, I now write the books uh, heavily, very heavily lawyered uh, before they're published. And, and, you know, we make various changes and tweaks and stuff uh, to try and make them better. But, you know, there's a whole, I mean, anyone who writes about financial crime um, is aware that there's a sort of a process of self-censorship that goes into the writing just before you publish anything. You know, you, you think before you even start researching a topic, can I, can I publish about this? And, you know, if you think, well, no, I can't, then you don't bother obviously beginning to research it because, um, you know, it's just a waste of time and effort to try and do something you, you're never going to be able to publish. And then the editor will have the same conversation when they commission a piece and then they'll have the same you know, conversation when they take delivery of it. And then obviously 
uh, you know, the lawyers will look at it and they'll have the same conversation. And, and then, you know, finally, you know, the article goes out there and you hope that you've made the right call and you're not going to get challenged. And um, so it, it does mean that like a really, you know, a lot of things don't see the light of day. But it, it, it's incorrect to say that I've got like a drawer full of, you know, manuscripts of sort of beautiful articles that have never been published. And there's one or two which, you know, died at that very final pre-publication stage. But But the vast majority of them, died way before that you know I remember after um, Roman Abramovich was sanctioned and Chelsea Football Club was was frozen quite a lot of editors got in touch with me and said well can you write us you know 3,000 words on him and where he got his money from and I said well no I can't because I've never done any work on him because it literally never occurred to me I'd be able to write about him so why would I have wasted my time and and so there's a lot of that going on and I think it's one thing that American journalists who move to the UK or spend any time in the UK really struggle to get their heads around. You know, they'll often talk about not having to stand, not being able to stand a story up. You know, they wanted to publish something but weren't able to. But they really struggle to to get their head around the idea that that they that you could stand a story up. You could be absolutely certain of your material. Um, you've got all the sources and you've got all the raw material and the court, you know, documents or whatever, but, but you can't publish it simply because, you know, it's too legally risky. Given the litigious nature of your beat, um, so to speak, how do you handle your record keeping and um, things like transcripts and general reporting? Yeah, I've become much more uh, fastidious. When I was um, researching my first couple of books and and the articles I did then, I I would rely on my shorthand and uh, notebooks to, to keep notes and you know, that, that was fine for what I needed to do then. But now, yeah, obviously now I, I record everything, transcribe everything, all that, Keep try and keep not just records of all the conversations and everything and, and, and the meetings, but also, uh, you know, notes of my thought processes as I go along. I'm confident that as a journalist, I work in a open, transparent and kind of correct way. But obviously, it's not enough to be confident in myself. I need to be able to show that in the future. You know, I'm ho- hopeful I'll never have to. Hopefully, that that it, you know, everything will be fine, and everyone will just leave me in peace to do what I do in my little corner of the Welsh borders. But, but um, you know, it's 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 better to try and be sure of that in advance. I I, I recently wrote an article for uh, the Economist 1843 magazine um, about this sort of new frontier in the pushback from wealth against journalism, which is the use of data protection legislation as a sort of adjunct to to defamation rules which it's not a new thing but it's it's like really growing as a phenomenon and that's quite terrifying actually because um it's incredibly time consuming to have to deal with those kind of requests and very expensive uh, even if you're a big publication and if you're just one person like me then you know, obviously that's alarming so you know i have to try and be even more careful in the records i keep it's a, a rule of the podcast that we always ask about money and how it interacts with people's writing lives. And to be clear, this is this is not other oligarchs' money, but your own your own finances. Um, and, and be as as candid or as guarded as you're you're comfortable with. But you know, since uh, you know you've you've worked freelance for fifteen years, how how do you make it work in terms of getting paid for books for the articles? Do you do other work beyond that? How has that that whole piece worked for you? Yeah, I mean, I try and stay nimble, so I try and make sure that I'm always doing lots of different things just on the on the principle that you know journalism is really fast changing at the moment and you never quite know what's going to disappear you know newspaper I mean magazines that you know, I tried really really hard to pitch pieces to and work you know really hard to get pieces into and was really proud that I got them in there and thought of them that that would be a string for ages and then the magazines have just vanished altogether you know because you know that's that's how how sort of turbulent everything is so I do I've, I mean I've just done a radio series I obviously write articles I, you know, I do kind of talking head type things on the telly if people want opinions about, you know, oligarchs or, or whatever. Um, you know, I try and restrict that. I think you can get a bit carried away with the giving opinions. So I only, you know, I'm quite careful. I need to give opinions on things when I think my opinion's actually worth something. But yeah, I'll do a bit of that if asked. Um, obviously, there's the books. And then I do sort of talks to, you know, bank compliance departments about financial crime or, or, or um, obviously to literary festivals, things like that. So they do lots of lots of different things um, and try and keep all of those things active and, and current, which can be a bit exhausting. Uh, but at the moment, it's going OK. You know, I'm not going to lie, though. It is quite useful being married to a doctor because there is this, you know, in fact, I've, when I've given talks in journalism schools, they all say, what's your top tip on 
becoming a, ge- a journalist or what's your top tip on going freelance and marry a doctor because it is really useful to have someone who's got a you know, very steady income uh, that you can rely on because I know that if I can't sell a pitch for a while or if there's a big economic downturn and no one wants articles about you know what the stuff that I write about it is quite useful to know that I'm not going to starve because I know that that, that she's still going to you know be be earning money from being in the NHS so that's something you know and and it is I mean I you know, I have friends who are married to other freelance journalists and I think it can be a bit precarious at times. On a related note, how do you divide up your your time between those different pursuits and do you keep rigid office hours or are you nimble in that respect as well? No, I'm pretty pretty geeky about my working hours. Um, I, I'm pretty disciplined about that. I went to see uh, Philip Pullman speaking once at a literary festival and he said that um, uh, the muse has to know where to find him um, so, you know, he's, he's sort of open to inspiration, but he has to be at his desk because otherwise the muse won't know where to find him. I quite like that saying. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty strict about my, my working hours and I, I work quite long hours. Um, I, I'm in terms of dividing things up. The, the challenge is always trying to stay fresh because it's perfectly possible, particularly when the books just come out to spend all your time going to literary festivals and talking about the work you've already done. Um, but then a time comes when that work dries up and you haven't got anything else to talk about anymore. So it's quite important to try and keep doing new work and new articles, new investigations all the time. So, you know, because the book, when the books just come out, the way that the um, book advances go is when the book gets published, you get a chunk of the advance, which is quite nice because it feels like you've already done all the work and you're, you know, so, so you've been paid after you've, you've done the work. So it feels a, a very little bit like free money. It isn't obviously, but it feels a little bit like it is. Um, so I'm I'm using this period to to do to try and do work on investigation on a subject I've never worked on before, um, just to try and keep my palate fresh and keep keep moving on to to new areas because you know otherwise you get a bit stale. Um, but yeah, I, I like I like mixing things up and you know sometimes it's sometimes I end up doing more of one thing and sometimes more of another. But but there always seems to be stuff to to to, to keep going at. Could you? Tell us a bit about the role of first person writing in your work. I was struck particularly in Moneyland that there's almost a kind of travel log element here that you know it, it's an investigative book but you are traveling to these places as a kind of wry observational element with it is that how has that evolved as a strand of your work yeah so i began as a teenager my my sort of dream job was to be patrick lee firm or fitzroy mclean or, or um you know one of those uh sort of british posh travel writers who wandered around Eastern Europe staying with honorary consuls in Budapest and things like that. That was my dream. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to be one of those people. So I always had a sort of slight travel writing air about me. You know, Let Our Fame Be Great is quite travel writing. Uh, the Last Man in Russia, which is my second book, is even more so. Um, so I think that there's always a slight role in that. I've been trying to dial it back because you know, it's quite self-indulgent. You can get a bit carried away and it all gets a bit sort of absurd. But I think particularly when writing about financial crime um, and when writing about in something like Moneyland, when something that essentially what I'm writing about is the absence of something to write about because I'm going somewhere and failing to find something. That's the point. So that section, say, for example, when I went to the island of Nevis to investigate the fact that it's a particularly opaque tax haven, I knew when I was going there that I would not find anything. Right. That was obvious. You, you you don't far more potent people than me have gone to Nevis and failed to find anything. It was obvious I was never going to find anything. I had no court order. I had no lawyer. I had no army of people on my side. It was just me getting off a boat, failing to find something. So the story is, here's how how do I describe an empty space? Right. So what do you do? Well, well, just wandering around, failing to find anything is is going to have to be how you do it. Um, and that has to be first person, inevitably. Um, but you know, so so I I'll go into a, you know a book as a character, um, but only when it's necessary. Um, I don't think there's any. I don't see why you feel the need to record your emotional response to something when it's nothing to do with you. But but in terms of a, in a case like that, like you know when you're when it, when you're witnessing something or or you're failing to find something, and the point is that you're failing to find it, then you have to be there as a character. Um, and that, and it's quite fun. I think people, you know, certainly from response from readers, I think people quite like a bit of that, not too much, but I think readers quite like a, a occasionally breaking the fourth wall and, and, and sort of winking to the reader a little bit, just a recognition that this is, that this is absurd or a recognition that this is appalling. It just, just to sort of, 
to show that, you know, yes, you're right. You know, if you think this is appalling, that's because it is. Or if you think this is ridiculous, that's because it is. Um, you know, I think that that, you don't want to do too much of it, but a little bit of it is good. You know, a little bit like I'm very much not comparing myself to Phoebe Waller-Bridge, obviously, but just the way that, that Fleabag occasionally does that wink to the camera and occasionally a bit of a look. You know, she, it'd be awful if she did it all the time, but it works incredibly well with her doing it very occasionally. And particularly in the second series when, you know, the hot priest, I can't remember his name, um, he sees her doing it and it becomes this like, you know, and anyway, it's a, a yeah, anyway, I'm, I literally never thought that I'd compare myself to Fleabag. Um, but there you go. I quite like that as a, as a very occasional technique, but you can't do it too much or, or you know, it's very much has to be occasional. I wanted to ask actually about reporting dead ends and how you navigate those. So I feel like you've addressed that question. Yeah, yeah I do. I do it a lot. Navigating dead ends is yeah, how I roll. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time, unfortunately, but I wanted to ask you about your kind of tips for budding investigative journalists that want to follow you into this area. At the end of your book, you encourage people to get in touch with you and you offer a kind of list of sources that inspired you. What are your main tips or takeaways for, for people that are just starting out in this area? I suppose it, it's really important to have a, a speciality of some kind. Um, I'm glad I didn't start out in this area. I'm glad I started out as a Russianist and as a as a news agency reporter. Um, you know, it was hard work and a lot of people might have thought it was monotonous um, because you, you, you're writing, you know, a lot of very quick articles and stuff. But it, it gave me a, a, a grounding of skills I wouldn't have got any other way. Um, so, you know, I know some of my some of the best investigative journalists, people like Richard Brooks, um, you know, started as a tax tax lawyer, right? A tax inspector. You know, he was able to then use that to inform his journalism. Um, so, you know, the case with with others, American journalists who started out in the in the military, and we were able to use that experience to do other things. So, so I think have something you know to build on um, is really important because you know there's just so much to investigate out there. You know, it's just it, it's such a target rich environment. Everywhere is a scandal, so you need to have a, a somewhere to start because otherwise you, you're just going to you know, just look at the world in total bewilderment. So that would be, I suppose, my advice is to is to get some form of speciality. You know, and and it can be anything, right? I mean, you know, anything you're interested in. There's, you know, there, there's there's art scandals. There's you know, grain trade scandals. There's sports scandals. You know, it's it's just relentless. And then once you start, once you've got going, the scandals just lead one to another. It becomes very organic. But you do need somewhere to start. And as a final question from me, returning to Butler to the world, do you think there is hope for change here? Do you think that given what has happened with Ukraine and and the the kind of political will that has built up, that these situations you've exposed may improve? Yeah, it's it's a really important question. Um, There has been some change in the UK already this year. Um, You know, back in, in just after New Year, government minister Lord Agnew resigned in the House of Lords because of the the, the lack of progress tackling economic crime. Um, and then obviously the, the invasion of Ukraine happened. We've got an economic crime act, you know, imposing transparency on offshore owned property in the UK. And now we're promised another economic crime bill, which will address this sort of bleeding sore that is is company's house and the UK based shell companies, which is which is really good. So, you know, there is hope, obviously, that that is progress. But the real frustrating thing is the continuous failure to recognise that it, the issue cannot be solved by passing laws. This is a, a an issue that, that has to be solved by enforcing laws. And, and that's where, as a country, we're going wrong, going wrong in, in many, many directions, not just in economic crime and also in environmental law and in, in, in food standards all over the place. You know, so there has been progress, but but not nearly, not nearly enough. Um, and, and there's also a really dispiriting willingness by many journalists to just publish whatever gimmicky thing the government has announced you know michael gove says you know we must house ukrainian refugees in oligarchs houses it's like well i mean that was never going to happen that was clearly bollocks and yet it's in you know from you know in the daily mail and in the times and on the bbc or whatever these these gimmicks they toss out like you know chaff behind a, a warplane just to try and deflect missiles and it's so frustrating that they don't get called out on them or chased up on them or people don't come back to them in six weeks and say what happened to that policy so that's frustrating. But, you know, there has been progress. There is recognition of this as a problem. You know, I suppose, you know, the thing I keep trying to bear in mind is something that my friend Daria Kalinyuk, who is a Ukrainian anti-corruption activist and an um, inspiration of mine, she's an incredible, incredible woman. Um, but she, once I asked her how she doesn't get depressed, considering how hard it is to tackle corruption in Ukraine, where it's very, very deeply entrenched. And she said that she doesn't think about it 
like defeating corruption, she said, well, we're at 4% now and my, and my, my aim is to get to five. And if we can get to five, I'll look around and wonder how we can get to six. So I suppose I'd try and think, you know, to tick off the benefits and say, well, we have had an economic crime act, which, you know, is cutting through offshore property ownership. So how can we make them use that? You know, how can I write about that to make it, you know, to, to, to use it? Because the goal is to try and, you know, undermine the, the, the basis of kleptocracy everywhere and therefore help people in Ukraine and Russia who, you know, the people who I, you know, care about to try and help them give them a chance to build democracy because right now they don't have that chance um so that's the the aim and and any you know any way that we can try and reduce the field of operation available to financial crime and to kleptocracy is, is means that we're increasing the size of the field available to democracy and and that's a good thing so you don't have to close that down altogether you can just close it down a bit and you're already having a positive impact. Well, that seems like a fitting note to end on. Thank you very much, Oliver, for your time and for speaking to us and wishing you all the very best with your ventures going forward. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Oliver Bullo. He's on Twitter at Oliver Bullo and Butler to the World is published by Profile Books. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway from the interview with Oliver? I was particularly fascinated to learn how he navigates the the legal minefield that is reporting on oligarchs in the UK, um, and particularly how the war in Ukraine has reshaped editors' priorities in terms of what what stories they're willing to take a, a risk on or invest in. But it was heartening to speak to Oliver as such a champion of investigative journalism, and also to hear his sort of efforts supporting the next generation. How about you? Yeah, I thought very much man of the hour. I mean, he's one of this this kind of group of British writers and journalists, I suppose, Catherine Belton as well, and then Tom Burgess, who've been plugging away on the the oligarchs and corrupt wealth beat for years. And then suddenly with the events this year in Ukraine, he's become, you know, really at the forefront of that. So I think it was a great time to get him on. And again, yeah, fascinating to lift the lid on on some of his process. And, and I suppose also the kind of like grim humor that he brought to, to doing it as well. So a really good um, addition to the podcast. I definitely recommend uh, reading some of his work. Anyway, Rachel, what have you been up to? Uh, well, we're now in a thicket of Christmas preparations, which involves a lot of year-end lists. But myself, I'm I'm reviewing She Said, the new film about Harvey Weinstein's crimes and the journalist of the New York Times who investigated him. So obviously that's a fairy in my wheelhouse. How about you? I've just had a big piece published this morning, actually, uh, which is exciting in Bloomberg Business Week, which is about people farming with robots. And I've been following this team for for several years for that so it's nice that that's out in the world and then i'm finalizing another story for 1843 and also doing a, a bunch more prep for my uh, my new book project so so busy with me as well anyway this has been always take notes hosted by me simon Aikham. and me rachel lloyd our producer and social media editor is artemis irvin our score is by jess danheiser and our graphic design is by james edgar if you'd like to follow us on social media we're on instagram at always take notes we're on Twitter at Tech Notes Always. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there and always take notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.